Welcome to the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. We are exploring topic number 12 of the 24 lessons. And our subject tonight is 1000 years of peace. Let's begin with a story recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Here we see King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He came to attack God's city of Jerusalem. He even burns the house of God with fire. He takes the sacred vessels of silver and gold all the way to Babylon and puts it in the house of his God there. He plunders the entire country and takes many people captives. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 36, 21, that all these things happened to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate, she keepeth the Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. For seventy years, the land was desolate. And during this desolation period, the land was observing the Sabbath, the Bible says. Now in the Bible, you have the weekly Sabbath that comes on the seventh day of the week, which was given at creation time. The Sabbath was made for man or for mankind. There is also the harvest Sabbath that God gave during the time of Moses for the children of Israel. Here, the agricultural land was to rest every seventh year. And there is another big Sabbath that will commence very soon when Jesus comes at the end of 6,000 years of Earth's history. This is the Sabbath where the entire planet Earth will rest from all activities. Let's go to the beginning of time. Our world was first created with a perfect balance in nature. Man, animals and plants lived in total harmony. This world and all that in them is, was God's masterpiece of wonderful and perfect creation. But with the entrance of sin, everything changed. Man started eating animals and animals began eating each other. Thorns and thistles sprouted everywhere. The curse that comes with sin started to erode the planet. God told Adam after the fall, in the sweat of thy face, Thou shalt eat bread, Genesis 3.19. Otherwise, it was just plucking the fruits and eating. But now, man had to toil to sustain himself. Isn't that true even today? God later told Cain, who was the first murderer of this planet, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 12. The scourge of sin depleted even the soil from which man was taken. The soil from which we were taken started to become weak and diminished in its properties, just like man started to grow physically, morally, and spiritually weak. That is why God told Cain, these words. When God brought the children of Israel to the land flowing with milk and honey, the most fertile soil in the world, God gave them a very special command regarding cultivation and harvest. He said, six years you shall sow your land and gather its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. Exodus 23, verses 10 and 11. 
the land had to rest every seventh year, just like the people had to rest every seventh day. It would give the ground a chance to recover its vitality and provide a voluntary crop to the poor to eat as well. But the children of Israel soon disregarded this command of God after entering the promised land. Because of their greed, they continued to till the ground on the sabbatical seventh year. For 490 years, they continued in their rebellion. During this 490 years, you, they desecrated 70 Sabbaths of the land. God kept account of all of them. Finally, God said, let me let the land keep her Sabbath for all the years that it missed. So he had to take these rebels out of the country and let the land enjoy what it lost. Nebuchadnezzar's army came, plundered everything. The Bible says, and they burned the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire. Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon came. He came to Judah and he executed all who rebelled against him. Others were carried off to the golden city of Babylon. Notice what Second Chronicles 36 says, and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Second Chronicles chapter 36 verses 20 and 21. Meanwhile, the land of Israel was in complete ruins. And here it says she enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate, she kept the Sabbath. At the end of 70 years, the survivors returned to Canaan to plant again in the promised land and to build Jerusalem once again. Beloved, God's word never fails. God will accomplish it even if people are disobedient but that will be hard for them. Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11 says, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. The Bible says the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Nehemiah 1, 3. Jerusalem here represents the earth. The earth also will be broken down and will be on fire at the second coming of Jesus because people have transgressed the word of God. For 6,000 years now, Jesus has been sowing the seeds of the gospel truth. The sowing time, remember, was for six years. So also for 6,000 years, the spiritual sowing has been going on. Jesus also compares the work of the gospel to the harvest of the world. He said in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 39, the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. The earth will be reaped when Jesus comes. The Bible tells us, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, 2 Peter 3, 8. So at the end of 6,000 years, 
we can expect the harvest of God's people to take place. Soon, King Jesus will come to harvest this world. And when he comes, the wicked will be slain by the brightness of his coming and his people will be carried off to the golden city. Just like when King Nebuchadnezzar came, we see some were carried to the golden kingdom and the rest were slain. Then this tired old planet will keep 1,000 year Sabbath. Let's begin with our first question. What events mark the beginning of the 1000 years? Paul wrote, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. The harvest of the dead will take place as they will be resurrected from the tombs, from the ground. Only the sleeping saints will rise to eternal life. This is the beginning of the thousand years rest for planet Earth. John wrote, And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 in the mansion of glory, in the golden palace of the king of the universe, God's people, the resurrected dead and the living translated will spend a thousand years doing a very special work. What about the rest of the dead or the wicked dead who were not resurrected at the second coming of Jesus? John wrote, about this group as well. He wrote, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Revelation 20 and verse 5. The first resurrection is for the blessed people of God. John wrote in the very next verse, Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. After the completion of 1000 years from the first resurrection, the second resurrection for the rest of the dead will take place. The 1000 years of Revelation 20 is often called the millennium. The word millennium is simply a Latin composite of two words, milli meaning 1000 and annum meaning years. The second coming of Jesus and the resurrection of the righteous, they mark the beginning of 1000 years. The saints of God described as blessed and holy will be raised in the first resurrection. So there is a thousand year period between the first and the second resurrection. Let's go to question number two. What else will happen at the first resurrection? Paul wrote, a change will take place for the righteous. He said, 
we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment at the last trump. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. The dead rise to life in a changed and a marked manner. Then they went to the grave. Paul continued, For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52. And then he said, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. This mortal body of ours will change to immortal bodies. This corruptible body will change to incorruption. This weak body of ours will change to strong bodies. This dying bodies of ours will change to ever lively bodies, which will show no signs of decay or death anymore. Paul said, who shall change our wild bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Philippians 3 and verse 21. Our bodies shall be same as Jesus' body after his resurrection. Remember, while the doors were still closed, he walked in. Remember, he defied the laws of gravity and ascended to heaven just like that with that new body. Remember, Jesus also had flesh and bones in his resurrected body. So we will be real just as we are now, but glorified. Now we will see what will happen to the wicked living when Jesus comes. Paul wrote, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. The brightness of Jesus' glorious second coming is too much for them to bear. Sinful man cannot live in the presence of a holy God. Only God's people will be able to stand in his presence as they are given immortal bodies at that time. What will happen to the earth when Jesus comes? The Bible says, And there was a great earthquake, such as not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 18. This will be the greatest earthquake ever. Thrice John emphasizes of the greatness of this earthquake. He says, a great earthquake, so mighty an earthquake and so great. All the man-made structures will come crumbling down during this earthquake. All what man has made from the dust and man himself who is from the dust will go back to the dust. For dust you are, unto dust you shall return. Also the Bible says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon man a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. That's around 75 pounds. We see in Revelation 16, 20, and 21. A talent is around 75 pounds or 35 kilograms. Utter destruction will take place at this time. As the wicked people are destroyed, what will happen to Satan and his angels? The Bible says an angel laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Revelation 20, verses 1 and 2. The devil is not destroyed with the wicked people 
at the second coming of Jesus. He is kept alive, bound for 1,000 years. He is bound in the bottomless pit. What is the bottomless pit? It comes from the Greek word abusos. Abusos is also used in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament Bible. In Genesis 1 2, it says the earth was without form and void before God created life on planet earth. This dark earth, which was empty and shapeless and was filled with water, is called Abusos or Abyss. Remember, when Jesus drove out the devils from the man, the Bible says, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Luke 8 and verse 31. The word deep is the same Greek word used in Revelation 20 and verse 1. Abusos or bottomless pit. These devils did not want to go anywhere but to the waters of the Sea of Galilee. So Abusos or the bottomless pit is not some mysterious place. It is the earth itself which will become as it was in the pre-created state of Genesis 1 and verse 2. Let's go to our third question. Who will be raised in the second resurrection and when will it take place? Jesus said, All that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. In the first resurrection, it is the resurrection of life for the righteous. The second resurrection is the resurrection of damnation for the wicked. John wrote in Revelation, when will the resurrection of damnation take place? He said, but the rest of the dead, that's the wicked, lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20 verse 5. So the wicked are raised in the general resurrection at the close of the thousand year period. Let's go to our fourth question. In what condition will the earth be left after the devastating earthquake and hailstorm that begin the thousand years? Isaiah wrote about what he saw. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down. The earth is utterly broken down. Isaiah 24, 1 and 19. The earth will be empty with no man, no life, no beast. The plants also will be dead, as the whole earth will be burnt up. It will be one big waste place. Everything turned topsy-turvy. Jeremiah wrote, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. Jeremiah 4 and verse 23. And then he writes, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. There was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. Jeremiah 4, 24 and 25. And he continues, The fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His fierce anger. Jeremiah 4 and verse 26. No man, no birds, no animals, nothing. All the cities all the skyscrapers in the cities will be down to the ground because of that mighty earthquake and the Lord's fierce anger. Jeremiah adds, And the slain of the Lord 
shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. Jeremiah 25 verse 33. The earth will be totally devastated by the earthquake and the hailstorm that strike at the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus. It will be left in complete darkness. Dead people will lie strewn across the earth's surface with no one mourning because there is no one left alive. The righteous all will be in heaven and the wicked will all be dead. Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Encouraging and enlightening, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are easy to understand. Each study guide leads you toward real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Available in English, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu. Don't wait. Order your complete set of study guides today by visiting bookstore.aftv.in. Let's go to our question number five. Where will the saints be during the 1000 years and what will they be doing? Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there he may be also. John 14, 3. So Jesus is coming to receive us to himself, to take us to our Father's house, where we are going to enjoy the mansions of glory. John saw the righteous engaged in a special work once they go to heaven. The Bible says, I and I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. For 1,000 years, we will be engaged in a work of judgment along with Jesus while the wicked people lie dead and while Satan is bound on planet Earth along with his evil angels. Paul wrote, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. And he also said, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 3. During the 1,000 years, the saints in heaven will be participating in a judgment. They will not decide who is saved or lost because God has already determined that. They will simply confirm the judgments of God. Revelation 15 and 4 says, For the, thy judgments are made manifest. The fairness of God's punishment for the lost people will be affirmed as well as the rewards for the righteous. This phase of judgment is for the benefit of the saints. For example, Suppose you got to heaven and discovered your beloved pastor is not there, yet some infamous criminal is there. You would probably need some kind of explanation. The angels of God then will guide us through the record books to settle all our doubts. At the end of this phase of judgment, all will be totally convinced that God's justice, God's love has been impartial in dealing with all. They will declare, for true and righteous 
are thy judgments. Revelation 19 and verse 2. Baron Fabian von Slabrendorf was born in Germany in 1907. Trained as a lawyer, he eventually joined the German army before World War II was rapidly promoted. Realizing that Adolf Hitler was insane and destroying Europe, he joined the resistance on March 13, 1943, during a visit by Hitler to an army center headquarters, Baron Fabian smuggled a time bomb onto the aircraft to carry Hitler back to Germany. The bomb's failure to detonate led to Baron Fabian's arrest. The Baron was sent to Gettespo prison where he was tortured, but he refused to talk. Early in 1945, the Baron was brought before the Nazi court, charged with an attempt on Hitler's life. After a short trial, the judge found Baron guilty of high treason and sentenced him to death. Because it was wartime, the execution was ordered to take place at once. As the Baron was being led away from the court to the room of firing squad, suddenly the terrifying sound of an allied air raid was heard. Before anyone could run to safety, a giant bomb scored a direct hit on the court and demolished it into a pile of rubble. All of those connected with the trial were killed instantly by the blast. All, that is, except one man. By some incredible miracle, the explosion which killed everyone else in the courtroom spared the life of the Baron, the very man who had just been condemned to die before a firing squad. With no one around him, the Baron escaped from the shattered building. Later apprehended, he was sent to Dachau, but was eventually liberated by US forces in early May 1945. He finally became a judge in the very country he had been condemned to death. After the war, Fabian was a judge of the Constitutional Court of the Federal Republic of Germany from 1967 to 1975. Fabian died in 1980. Interesting story indeed of a man who was judged to death, then escaped that death by a bomb blast that killed his foes. And finally, he became a judge instead. Beloved, the same way the Bible teaches that a dramatic reversal of roles will take place for God's people. They will be condemned to die during the mark of the beast issue. As they are about to be executed, a mighty bomb blast from heaven will take place and destroy all the buildings and all the wicked and the people who determined to kill the righteous and the righteous will be set free to live forever. You know, God's people have been judged by the wicked of this world, but now there is a reversal of roles and God's people judge the wicked. Let's go to question number six. What will happen at the close of the 1000 years? The Bible says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1, 4, 5, and 9. 
Jesus is going to come back and land on Mount Olives in Jerusalem. Remember, that's where from where he took off to heaven. Zechariah 14, 5 says, And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So Jesus, along with the redeemed people and the host of heavenly angels, will come back to earth. Not only they will be coming, but God's city is coming as well. John wrote, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. Revelation 21 and verse 2. At the close of 1,000 years, the saints will come along with Jesus and the angels, and also the city, New Jerusalem, will descend from heaven and land on Mount of Olives. The Lord will flatten the hill and make a great plain for the city's landing site. Let's go to question number seven. What will happen next to free Satan from his prison? The Bible tells us, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. The phrase, they live not until the thousand years were finished, implies they will live after the thousand years will be finished. There will be a resurrection of the wicked taking place at this point of time. It is judgment time for them. Also, the Bible says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan is loosed out of his prison. Revelation 20 and verse 7. After the wicked are resurrected, Satan will once again be free to deceive and to manipulate them. He has a work at hand and a target as well, God's city and the saints who are safely enclosed in it. Napoleon Bonaparte, after ruling most of Western Europe for 10 years, we see Napoleon was defeated as he tried to take complete control of Europe. The war of the Sixth Coalition was better known as the Battle of Nations, which was the largest battle in European history before the First World War, allowed the Allies to occupy Paris, forcing his uh, abdication and banishment to Elba. Realizing he was soon to be sent to another island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, Napoleon Bonaparte made a daring escape from his exile to Elba on February 26, 1815. Once the bane of Europe, he returned to the continent bent on restoring his military legacy, sealing his fate just 111 days later at Waterloo. Everything came to a crashing halt two days later facing a combined British and Prussian line at Waterloo on the outskirts of the Belgian capital of uh, Brussels. Napoleon's men were overrun on 18 June 1815. Four days later, officials from the coalition demanded Napoleon abdicate again. This time, the French hero was sent to the island of St. Helena, a British territory more than a thousand miles south of West Africa. There would be no escape this time. Napoleon would die there some five and a half years later. Beloved, the same way, Satan, the greatest enemy warrior, also is going to be captured at the second coming of Jesus and bound for a thousand years in a lonely planet. And then he would die at the end of this period as judgment will be executed on him and his host. Let's go to 
Question number eight. What will Satan do when the wicked are raised? The Bible says, and they shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Revelation 20 and verse 8. Gog and Magog are symbols of Satan and his territory. This picture is employed from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38 verse 3 says, Gog, the chief prince. And Ezekiel 38 verse 2 says, land of Magog. So Gog was the chief prince of the land of Magog. He and his hosts were enemies of Israel who came fighting against them. Now in Revelation 20, Satan is symbolized as Gog, the prince of this world, and Magog are the people of the world who come and fight against the people of God and the holy city. John wrote, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9. Satan and his hosts are going to surround the city of God in an attempt to overthrow it. In the book of Ezekiel, it is written, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 16. Satan will deceive people into believing that he was unjustly deposed from heaven and that together they can capture the city and take control. Realizing they are shut out from the holy city, the wicked will organize an attack to conquer New Jerusalem. Let's go to question number nine. Question nine. At this crucial moment, what will stop everything? John wrote, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 and 12. Note, God's throne will suddenly be seen on the top of the city of God and the final phase of judgment begins. The assault on the city of God is thus brought to instant halt. The books will be opened and every person's life will be made to pass before him. Everything will be open for the wicked and for the righteous to see, as you can see that in Luke chapter 12, verses two and three. God is fair. He will show them why they are lost and he will show them the many attempts he has made to save them and how they despised his tender pleadings. He will show them all the sins that they have committed in their lives, the public ones and the private ones, and why they deserve not to be saved. We'll go to question number 10. What will happen after the wicked are judged? The Bible says, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Romans 14, 11. And again, we read that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2 verses 10 and 11. Everyone will bow and confess. Everyone includes Satan, his evil angels, the wicked people, also the holy angels, 
and the righteous people as well. Everyone will acknowledge that God is fair. All see God was absolutely just in his dealing with all people, including his enemies. John wrote, and I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, true and righteous are his judgments. Revelation 19 verses 1 and 2. After this universal admission, the controversy will forever be settled and it will be now safe to destroy sinners. Let's go to question number 11. What will happen next? John wrote, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 20 and verse 9. As the wicked try to attack again the city of God, God brings the final judgment on all of them and they are devoured in the lake of fire and brimstone. John wrote, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 and verse 5. And he added, this is the second death. Revelation 20 and verse 14. God's fire will then fall upon the wicked. And this vast lake of fire will surround the whole city and the whole world. This fire will eventually bring everyone to ashes, the wicked. The millennium is a thousand year period. The beginning of this period is marked by the second coming of Jesus and the resurrection of the just. The end of this period is marked by the third coming of Jesus and the city of God, along with the saints of God and the resurrection of the wicked takes place at this point of time. During the millennium, the righteous are in heaven, judging the wicked, and the earth is desolate as the people are all dead, and Satan and his angels are bound in this dark, desolate earth. Let's go to question number 12. After the fire goes out, what will God do for his people? Isaiah wrote, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65 verse 17. And John the apostle wrote in Revelation, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Revelation 21 and verse 1. And Peter wrote, We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Second Peter 3 and verse 13. Remember, at the end of 70 years of Babylonian captivity, the children of Israel returned to the promised land and they rebuilt the city. So also after the millennium, the saints of God will witness as Jesus recreates the new heavens, the atmosphere and the new earth, a perfect earth where sin will never show its ugly face again. The paradise that Adam and Eve lost by sin will be restored in all glory and even greater. Peace, joy, love, and perfect happiness will rest upon God's people forever. Our next question, where will God and the righteous finally live? The Bible says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Revelation 21, verse 3. And Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5 and verse 5. Dear friends, will you accept Jesus' offer 
of eternal life and a place in the new earth? Just think of it. Having God for your neighbor, having the angels next to you, having the great saints of all ages, like Adam and Enoch and Abraham, Daniel, Peter, Paul, John, as your neighbors. Wow, what a lovely time for eternity. Let's choose life and live in heaven for a thousand years and then for eternity in the new earth with God and his people. Won't you want to be a part of that wonderful time in heaven, the thousand years of peace and eternal peace in the new earth? I hope we all would be there. Let's pray. Our holy and gracious God, thank you for the great Sabbath rest that will come for planet Earth at the end of 6,000 years of the sowing of gospel seed. Thank you that we are going to spend that millennium Sabbath in our Father's house. We thank you, Father, that you will save your people. Help us all to be in that first resurrection where God's saints will get up or if we are alive, will be translated. We're waiting for that day. We're waiting for that millennium rest and the eternal rest to follow. In Jesus' name, Amen. Among the people living in the tropics, for thousands of years, the coconut has been a virtual tree of life. The people use it for food, for clothing, for water, for tools, for soap. It does just about everything. The coconut has also saved a lot of lives. During World War II, pilots that were shot down or sailors that were stranded on Pacific Islands, they lived for many months on nothing other than the coconut trees that were on their islands. Yes, sir, the coconut is a tree of life. One of the amazing things about the coconut is they're designed so they're actually able to float across oceans. Coconuts can go thousands of miles after many months, be washed up on some deserted sandy beach, then they take root, sprout, come to life, and they'll develop a whole new ecosystem, holding islands in place through a hurricane. When the ancient Polynesian travelers crossing oceans saw an island with coconut trees, they knew there was hope. It's amazing how, in virtually no time at all, those living on Pacific Islands know how to make baskets and all kinds of tools from the leaves of the coconut tree. The coconuts even serve different purposes at different times in their development. The younger green coconut, they're full of water and that'll keep you alive. Mm. You can even make your utensils from the coconut. My spoon is part of the green shell. And here, this is a coconut jelly. Makes good for breakfast. The more mature coconuts, that's where you get the meat. But you wanna make sure that they're not bad. And the way you test this is you can hear the water inside. Here, bring that mic over here. Can you hear it? That's a good one. How about we take a bite? Now that makes a meal that will really fill you up and it cleans your teeth at the same time. Throughout the Bible, Jesus uses a number of metaphors to remind us that everything we need to survive comes from him. He says that he's the living water. Jesus tells us he is the bread of life. His robe covers us with righteousness. He is our good shepherd that protects us. Jesus is the living vine through which we get our life and our nourishment. You might say Jesus is like the coconut tree, a tree of life. You know, the first few verses in the Bible tell that God provided a tree of life for man so he could live forever. But because of sin, man was separated from that tree and from the garden. 
But through trusting in Jesus and trusting in His sacrifice on the cross, we once again will have access to the tree of life and have eternal life with Him in the kingdom. But this is all made possible because we trust in Jesus, who is the real tree of life. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But when we accept Christ as our sacrifice and we allow him to cleanse us and fill us with his spirit, we become new creatures. And we can be with him in sharing the gift of everlasting life with others. Matter of fact, we could do that right now by tossing a coconut out and praying that it lands on a deserted beach. Have you ever wondered what it will be like when Christ returns? Well, Amazing Facts has created this beautifully illustrated 50-page magazine that talks about the major themes of His soon return. It talks about the signs of Christ's coming. What is a secret rapture and how can you prepare? It talks about the judgment and the 1,44,000. Who are they? It talks about the millennium and the earth made new. All of this packed into one beautiful magazine you'll enjoy reading and sharing with friends. To order your copy today, please visit bookstore.aftv.in.